Well, hey, everyone. Welcome to the Intentional Life Podcast. My name is Ben Cornick. And I'm Courtney Asher. We're coming to you uh, from Christ the Rock Community Church in Menasha, Wisconsin. And this is a podcast all about what it means for us to be disciples who make disciples of Jesus and live the intentional life of Jesus. And uh, right now we're in a kind of a mini series of episodes where we're talking about the three components of disciple making. And in this one, we're going to talk about uh, this kind of vehicle for a discipleship group, because remember, the three components of a discipleship group are the intentional leader, and that's our driver. Mm -hmm. Uh, Then you have the vehicle that the driver is driving, which is the relational environment that the group happens in. And then there's the reproducible process. This is the map. This is kind of the, the, the area that we're trying to get to, the place that we're going together as a group. And so the relational environment is what we set up at CTR in our discipleship groups. And it's such an important piece if we really want to see a discipleship making movement happen here in our church and in churches uh, all around the area and hopefully around the country and around the world. There's a huge discipleship making movement happening all over the place. Uh, But Courtney, tell us, what what is this relational environment? Like, what what does this vehicle look like? What does it feel like when you know that you have that in a discipleship group? Yeah, yeah, that's great. There's some characteristics of a discipleship group that are maybe pretty different than what you might have experienced in previous Bible studies or small Mm. groups, right? Like, what we really want to see is that everyone's authentic, that you're Mm. real with one another. If, If you're not, you know, looking at the Word and addressing what's really going on in my heart, there's no chance for you to grow, right? And so you got to be honest. Here's where I'm at. Here's what I'm wrestling with. I want to be my authentic self. I don't understand that, you know, that mm-hmm. kind of thing. Stepping yeah. into the group in a way that's real. Well, and opposed <clears> to that <throat> is that sometimes you're in a group where it, you can just tell right away that people can't be real. Yeah. Uh, that it's almost like let's all impress each other with our Bible knowledge. Let's like, let's kind of kind of have a mask on. Let's yep. put on our best front when it's actually like, well, really, this should be the place where you can bring all that and be real and have people care for you. Yep. Yep. Ask your questions. And, um, you know, one of the things you said about kind of putting on a mask reminds me of the, one of the other characteristics that if, if we're really doing discipleship well, the group is safe. Mm. So we have relationship with one another. We trust each other enough that I can share with you, you know, my struggles, or I can ask my questions, or I can say, I I really don't know who this book was written to or for what purpose. (laughs) Right. Um, but, we can be honest about that in the group setting so that we can all learn from one another and grow. And so it's also a safe environment. And mm-hmm. we encourage the groups to be confidential and keep what they're talking about to their group and making sure that they're really, you know, stewarding one another's stories well. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that's a really important part. Yeah. Um, and then there's also mutual accountability. And I want to talk about this one for a minute because often when we put ourselves in the leadership position, leadership of a class or a Bible study or a a small group, we have the feel at least that, you know, I'm kind of the expert, right? Like I'm as the leader, I know what I'm talking about Mm -hmm. and you all are here to learn from me, right? And so we kind of give the impression sometimes, whether it's intentional or not, that I've gone a little further than you, or maybe I I know enough about the Bible that I can lead a Bible study, right? Mm -hmm. And we actually want to dismantle that idea idea or Mm -hmm. ideology. And we want to ask people to go, if you're going to be a leader, you're going to be mutually accountable to the people that you're walking with. And Mm -hmm. so you're actually going to share with them, here's what's going on in my marriage that I could use prayer for, or here's what this scripture means to me or what the Holy Spirit's convicting me of. Mm -hmm. Um, And that mutual accountability means that I, as the leader, am not stagnant, stagnated in well, I just learned all of this class material and that's the end for me, right? It's like I'm continuing to grow also and being challenged equally by those that I'm in relationship with. Mm -hmm. And so it's a little different um, setting up that tone, Mm -hmm. making sure that um, we're accountable to one another in this group to grow, but that the leader is not an exception to that rule, that the leader is actually modeling that. So it's really important. That's really important. Um, And then the last one is that the group would meet the needs of its members. Mm -hmm. And so... um, you know, one of the things we've talked about before is like the concept that if you're a part of a church, you have maybe have had the mentality that, man, if I need this, the church should provide it for me, right? Like mm-hmm. we should have a ministry to meet every need of every individual unique person in this church. Yeah. And, and I do have an extreme example of that. All right, is, let's hear uh, it. Years ago, I was a pastor at a church in Illinois and, uh, and hopefully the woman I'm about to talk to doesn't listen to this podcast. And even if she does, it's fine. Um, <laughs> but she just, it was just an interesting moment because she came up to me in the lobby and she asked about our groups and I was telling her about it. And she said, well, what I noticed is that you don't have a singles group 
for people in their late 30s and early 40s who like to do things like play volleyball and go kayaking. Mm-hmm. And I just remember being like, whoa, wait. <laughs> I'm like, that is just multiple layers so deep of so, <laughs> such specificity. Yep. And I said, have you been to a church that has a group like that? And she was like, well, yeah, Willow Creek. And I was like, well, Willow Creek is like literally 10 times the size yeah. of the church I was yeah. working at. So I was like, okay, um, I, I'll say that we have some groups that I think might have people who are single or might be mm-hmm. in that age category or might do things like kayaking, but we don't have a group that's like that, mm-hmm. and we're not going to have one unless yeah. maybe God calls you to start one. Yeah, yeah, um, right. And she was just like, and she literally was like, no, 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 I'm saying you need to make one for me mm-hmm. and other people like me. And I mean, it was just such a clear expectation yeah. she had. Yeah, And it was yeah. a, it was one of those moments where I said, there has to be a different way that we can do this. Right. You know, and it's even like meeting the practical needs that people, you know, need in a, in a church body. It's like someone has a surgery or Mm. has a baby or they're down and out financially or whatever. And, and we want the church to take care of them. But sometimes we think that the church means the staff, the leadership, those that are paid to be there. And we Mm -hmm. go, man, can you make sure that those people who are going through that situation with the surgery or are dealing with foster care kids or whatever, can you make sure they're taken care of? Mm -hmm. And really what we want to do is remind everyone, you're the church, you all are the church. Yeah. We're here to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry. We want you all to be in relationship with one another where you can meet one another's needs. Totally. And so in a discipleship group, we're going, man, if you do have somebody that's struggling in their marriage, like support that, pray for them, give them date nights and take their kids on, right? Amen. Meet the practical practical needs and don't, you know, instead hope that the church will put on a ministry for every, Mm. everything that we, you know, might need as a... Christ follower. Yeah. And I think what's interesting is the the Acts 2 Church is actually a really good example about that. So do you want to talk about that a little bit, Ben, the Acts 2 Church? Sure. Because here's the thing. And someone could go, oh, well, but at my church, we do it this way. Or I I heard about it. And I'm like, I just always want to bring people back to the scripture and say, we're not just pulling this stuff out of a hat. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, it's got to be authentic. It's got to be a safe place. It's it's got to meet the needs Mm -hmm. of the people in the group. Well, we get that out of the scripture. Yeah. And so in Acts uh, 2, uh, if you go, if you're in Acts 2, you can go all the way down to 42. And I'll just read a part of this. It says, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Uh, Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All believers were together and had everything in common. And then it says, the leaders sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. No, it says they sold yeah. property and possessions. So all of them were like, look, how can we help one another? Yeah. And then every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts. And so we see this incredible yeah. model right from the beginning. See, these are people who are living the intentional life of Jesus, like this whole Mm -hmm. intentional life thing. We didn't just come up with that because we're like, oh, that would sound cool. Mm -hmm. It's like, no, this is actually, this is the life of Jesus. And his early church lived that life together. And that's what we want to say, how do we do that in the 21st century? Mm -hmm. And so they fellowship together. They they would learn together. They would grow in the scriptures together. So it says that a lot of this had to do with them uh, learning and understanding the teaching of God's word. Uh, they would eat together. They'd mm-hmm. share meals together in each other's homes. And um, I- I'm telling you what, uh, if if you want to see a discipleship group really have fellowship, mm-hmm. uh, start eating together uh, yeah. because there's something powerful. Uh, and back in that culture, to eat together actually meant way more than just like, yeah, we're just eating food together. It really meant like we're, we're, really, we're really entering into something together. This mm-hmm. is real fellowship. This is real community. Um, mm-hmm. And then they bless each other with gifts and talents and treasures. And um, and so I, I think this is just such a powerful vision and picture yeah. of what the church can be. And this is why those early church leaders would write things like it says in Hebrews, like, don't give up meeting together as some are in the mm-hmm. habit of doing. Like, mm-hmm. don't give this up. Like, you know, like some people, it's almost like they'll have all their personal devotional times and they'll do all this stuff, but they won't actually be in fellowship with other believers. And yet from the very beginning, God said, it's not good for us to be alone. Yep. Like we weren't yep. supposed to do this alone. He means for us to do this in fellowship. And we see that right from the early days of the early church. Right. And the beauty of that is that that lifestyle becomes missional. Totally. So the last part of our intentional life is go. And we mm-hmm. say continually live on mission. Mm-hmm. The only way you can do that is if you have the perspective of Christ, right? Yeah. If you're thinking through the filter of what 
why am I here? You know, mm-hmm. what is my kingdom purpose? Why did God call me to this group of believers or to this, you know, neighborhood or this um, workplace? Yeah. And when you start to think like that, I mean, and you, you're stepping into meeting the needs of the people you're in relationship with, mm-hmm. you start to see the potential for more needs to be met, you know, mm-hmm. to bring people into that. It's not just you taking care of a single mom, it's your group taking care of a single mom, right? Yeah. And it's not just you mowing the lawn of the elderly, it's your group coming around and doing that together. And you mm-hmm. start to build literally the the fellowship of the disciples. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Do you, do you have any examples of that? Like just like a story where you saw a group do that? <clears throat> um, gosh, off the top of my head, I got to think now. Um, I, one, one thing that comes to mind is actually not, it's a person in a group that I think has infiltrated the group with this mindset in a really powerful way. So um, this family in particular was just raised with this mentality of like, what is ours is everyone's. Like God has given this stuff to us and it's mm. the best way to steward it is just to give back. So these people step into the most messy situations. I mean, just, you know, t- dealing with foster care, dealing with addictions, dealing with, mm. um, uh, mentally ill and just just you know you go how in the world are they taking that on but the the mindset there of like if i can contribute to this why wouldn't i like why would i look at someone else and go well, well you should do it you should mm-hmm. step into this situation or why is god bringing this situation to me with you know someone who's really struggling with addiction mm-hmm. and not somebody else and so the the mentality has shifted and so in in particular with this um, family and the way they've stepped into discipleship group it's kind of in- infiltrated the group to think that way and go what mm-hmm. are my skills and talents and ways that i can contribute and uh, it reminds me of the Dawson Trotman story, really, of like when he was in, initially in Navigators talking mm-hmm. about uh, discipling someone. Yep. And he had the first guy come to him and go, hey, I found somebody who needs to be discipled. Can you disciple him? And he looked at him and said, no, you can. Yeah. Right? <laughs> it's the same thing. It's like, hey, instead of asking for the church to hand out bread and have a food pantry and da da like great things, but what can you do? What can mm-hmm. you do? And why did God bring that in front of you yeah. to look at. Why were you the person that mm-hmm. God brought that person to? Yep. Yep. Uh, it's powerful. Yeah, so it's in it's in those moments I think too that like when we serve together, um we grow and so we think we're doing something that's really big for the kingdom outside of ourselves, but we end up stretching ourselves mm-hmm. in our kingdom perspective, right? Mm-hmm. And we go, "Wow, God is really intentional about these you know, random interactions. God is really strategic about uh, growing me in a way that's uncomfortable for me. And um, as we do that in relationship with one another, I mean, God is just going to root out those things in you and in your life that don't look like him and replace it with Holy Spirit power and the ability to see multiple lives changed. Mm. Yeah, that's powerful. Um, So yeah, so discipleship groups are missional. And, you know, with that too... I just want to make sure we note, like, there's different small group models of like, hey, let's be in in relationship together for, you know, life, life groups, or mm-hmm. um, let's make sure that we have a, str- you know, a simple curriculum thing that we're going through, and we're going to go through for three years, and then we'll break kind of thing. Mm-hmm. That's not how we do our groups here. We're really intentional about saying, hey, help people grow spiritually, and when they're ready to lead others... Let them lead. Launch them to lead. Mm -hmm. Um, And so keeping the missional focus keeps our eyes on the need of who still hasn't heard the Mm -hmm. gospel, right? Who's still out there that could be impacted by us as Christ followers and on mission committed to this kingdom work uh, that, man, we better invite them in. And so our groups are always adding people. They're multiplying. They're launching leaders. um, And they're making sure that what they do is keeping the focus on external, growing. So then, uh, so I, I mean, I, I think there's a natural progression to that then. Like if groups are missional, then they mm-hmm. would naturally become reproducible. Yeah. And yep. uh, like a missional movement is only one generation, uh, you know, uh, kind of strong unless yep. it's reproducible. Yep. So so what, yeah, what are great. the components <clears throat> of it being reproducible then? Like how do yeah. we have reproducible groups? Yeah, that's great. Um, well, the the main thing is keeping it simple. So, mm. and people will say that, like, well, we should just keep it simple. Keep it simple. But then somehow it gets really conv- <laughs> convoluted, you know, yeah, all by the si- time. By simple, if you <clears throat> if you read the subtext, it actually meant really, really uber complicated. <laughs> that's, <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's, that's how we seem to somehow. Yes. Yeah, yeah, and totally. I think you know when we think about it, we go, okay. 
okay, a mature disciple should, you know, they should tithe and they should have healthy relationships and they should be leading others to Jesus and sharing the gospel and all the good things. Mm -hmm. And we want to shoot for something that's really big and we go, wow, if somebody actually looks Christ-like and they are that mature, then we are going to have to do a lot of work to get there. Mm -hmm. But I think what we forget is we don't do any of that work. Right, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's the Holy Spirit that does that work, That's and such a all good we point. do is submit to it. So yep. whether or not somebody's going to grow is going to have more to do with God and them than it is you any day of the week. Well, it's, I mean, it's literally what Paul said. He said, "Look, one person can plant the seed, another person can water mm -hmm. it, but it's God who makes it grow." Mm -hmm. And so it's like we we actually can't take any of the credit. Like who like. Oh, I'm going to take the credit for putting a seed in the dirt. I'm going to take the credit for pouring some water on right, it. It's right, like, right. no, like e even when scientists explain how plants grow, I'm still boggled by it because I'm yeah. like, wait, isn't, isn't anyone stopping and just being like, but isn't that crazy that you put this little thing in the ground that it only becomes something when you put it in dirt and someone waters it? God's the one who does yeah. that. Yep. Like that still is miraculous yep. that there's people who you look at them and say, this person will never be a mature disciple in Christ. Well, let's tell them the gospel anyways. Let's try to build into them. Let's try mm -hmm. to. And then all of a sudden, those are the people that a couple of years later, they're yeah. like leading like, you know, they've, they've led two or three discipleship like, groups. And you're like, what is going on? Holy cow. Like, who is <clears throat> right. this person? Right. Yeah, it's totally God. So, so it is like knowing that no amount of strategy or training or, you know, workbook material that we can put mm. together is going to, you know, amount to a mature disciple. It's really the work of God in somebody's life. Yeah. And he uses the people of God, the mm -hmm. word of God and the spirit of God. And so if it's going to be reproducible, like we can hand it off to the next generation, the next generation, we got to think what could possibly sustain itself if the whole church had to go underground. I mean, I'm talking persecuted church. Like, what could sustain itself? Like, a uh, nine-piece band on a Sunday? Probably not, right? A coffee shop with the best beverages? Probably not. The best, most articulate leader at every gathering? Like, no, it's not going to happen. What's going to be sustainable is the people of God, the Spirit of God, and the Word of God. Yeah. So we take our groups and go, get in the Word of God and be actionably accountable to what the Spirit's telling you individually. Mm -hmm. And that is reproducible. Absolutely. Right? And we have different um, methodology for doing that. We do Bible storying here, so we get people in the Word and practicing that. But there's, you know, the SOAP method, mm -hmm. um, the HEAR method. The, there's different methods of going, like, how do I actually look at this text and move from theory, talking about it, to applying it? Mm -hmm. And then when I apply it, I am going to have an action coming out of that, something that I can do with it. Yep. And when I start to do those things, obedience produces Christ followers, continue mm -hmm. to grow in obedience. Yep. So we want to keep it simple, keep the main thing, the main thing, get yep. in the word, um, multiply it, hand off the mission. We talk about uh, the mission and making sure that we launch leaders. We don't get too comfortable in what we're doing in our group. That's like, oh, I love these people. I could never leave them, you know, mm -hmm. that we keep the mission, the focus and go, hey, but if we love these people, like somebody else is really going to love them too. Yeah. <laughs> and that and once you be... leave the group, you can't talk to them anymore, right? Exactly. You're yeah. totally cut off. Yeah, totally cut so off. So there's that. No, I, and actually, that, that's the <laughs> so when we talk about the map and we start to talk about reproducible, you know, process. It, what's really cool about that is that in your mind it feels like a loss. Like especially if you've been taught, like, hey, a group needs to like stay together for mm -hmm. life. It's like, well, we're not saying you can't have those relationships for life. And actually, the really cool yeah. thing is, uh, and, and and for anyone who's actually become like a physical parent, uh, being a spiritual parent has a similar thing where you've got to find that tribe of other parents who mm. you can look at and be like, this is exhausting, right? And they're like, yeah, totally. <laughs> like, okay, so I'm not the only one. And it's like, so you have to have days where you can call the people that you used to be in discipleship group with who are now all spiritual parents leading their own groups. Yeah. And you call them up yeah. and you go, hey, guys, I need some encouragement today. It's like now you've got people in your corner that you can call that not only were you in the trenches with back in your discipleship group, but now you can encourage one another mm -hmm. as you go on the front lines and go, mm -hmm. hey, we're all leading our own groups now. Um, so to me, like that that's actually like that's God adding to you. Yeah. Like say, not only will I turn you into a spiritual parent who will disciple others, uh, disciple other disciples of Jesus, but I'll also give you this cadre of other leaders yeah. that you will continue to do life with. But that doesn't mean that you have to keep all of that blessing in your one group mm -hmm. for the next, you know, 40 years. You can actually spread that out and allow God just trust him with it and allow yeah. him to do his thing. Yep. It's a blessing to be a part of, honestly. It's yeah. really cool to see. Um, so that's discipleship groups. They're relational, uh, reproducible, missional, 
And yep. we're really pumped up about doing them here at Christ the Rock, living the intentional life. Group's a big part of it, and, and we encourage anyone who's a part of our body who's not a part of a discipleship group yet to get connected that way because that's our number one vehicle for making disciples. Yep. Thanks for joining us on the Intentional Life Podcast, and we'll see you next time. See you then.